Okay, so let's get started. So this class, we're going to talk about the ambient and aircraft sampling. So let's do a quick recap of last class. So last class, we discussed the high temperature aerosol measurement. So we said that for high temperature measurement, they have applic applications for both the pollution control and also the synthesis of functional nanoparticles. So in these high temperature environment, there's generally a faster formation of the aerosols and this will create challenges in characterizing these aerosols. And further in terms of sampling and measuring these aerosols, there can be in situ measurement, which means that we just characterize the aerosols at the location where they're being formed. And then we said that we could use the optical methods, uh, optical measurement. We could also extract these aerosols and further do real-time measurements. For example, we just sample the aerosols out and then send it to a scanning mobility particle sizer to measure their size distributions. So for this measurement, it is still online, right? So same as the in-situ measure, these are online methods or real-time measurement. But the thing is that we have to extract the aerosol samples and we have to use these dilution sampling systems because we, quen we want to quench all the uh, downstream, let's say particle dynamics and also the gas to particle conversion or particle to gas conversion. So is that that in terms of the dilution sampling, we could use a straight tube sampler or the ST sampler or the hole in a tube sampler, HIAT sampler. And we could also collect these aerosols just directly on filters and then conduct offline analysis, for example, by using the thermophoretic sampler or directly deposit these particles onto thin films, right, as thin films, and then further characterize these aerosols. So this class, we're going to discuss the ambient aerosol measurement or the measurement conducted in the uh, on the research aircraft. So this is more um, towards the sampling of the atmospheric aerosols. So here I'm just showing you a few pictures of these uh, ambient measurement, right? So uh, if you look at the EPA stations, monitoring stations, or if you go to measurement campaigns for monitoring ambient aerosols, you will normally see that these instruments basically very expensive or complicated instruments are being housed on or inside these trailers. So we put them into trailers mainly because we want to make the instruments weatherproof, right? It doesn't matter whether it's raining or snowing, but also for many of these instruments, they require a relatively constant temperature. We mentioned earlier in the tandem differential mobility analyzer system that if temperature fluctuates by one degree Celsius, then you're going to create a significant change on the relative humidity of the instrument, right? Because the um, saturation vapor pressure of water also is a strong function of the temperature. So if temperature is biased or biased by a little bit, then your RH control will be having a very hard time. So we put these instruments into these trailers and also to organize these in instruments, we mount them onto these racks, so to save space and also um, I mean, to, for easier access of these instruments. So to um, design or to guide the ambient aerosols into these uh, trailers or into these, uh, um, let's say, the, um, these uh, boxes, right? So um, we have to follow certain, let's say, ambient aerosol sampling methods, okay? So basically for the, an ideal aerosol sampling system, we want to exclude the precipitation from the sampled aerosols. We want to take in raindrops or snow flakes, right? And also um, we want to provide a representative ambient aerosol sample with minimal diffusion or inertial losses. So we discussed the aerosol sampling losses at the beginning. We want to sample the very fine particles, right? But these particles are subject to strong uh, diffusion losses. We also want to sample the re relatively larger particles, but the larger particles, let's say super micron particles, then they have a larger inertia. So if you have a lot of bends in the system, then they will get lost through the inertial impaction. So, um, and we also want to provide aerosol particles at a low relative humidity, humidity, mainly because if they're under high RH, there's hygroscopic growth, right? And then um, for some of the instruments, they require, they require dried particles too. So uh, in order to avoid, let's say, water accumulation in the instrument. 
and eventually want to minimize the evaporation of volatile particulate species. Right? We want we don't want to use a very high temperature to warm the particles up. So the semi-volatiles will turn into gas phase. In that case, you will sample a basically sub-sample the aerosols, sub-characterize the mass of the particles. So there are considerations, and a lot of these sampling systems, they will require the considerations or the tailoring of a specific inlet, inlet system, right? So if you see these trailers or these cargo uh, cabins, right? So here you can see the AC unit that is to maintain the temperature, but normally they will have a very tall uh, sampling inlet. This is to avoid the boundary layer effects near the ground. And also, so you can take more representative uh, air that's above the ground, right? That represent a more, uh, let's say, realistic or representative sample uh, in our ambient environment. So because of that, uh, to take the aerosols, we need to use the uh, the vertical stack that's installed uh, on these uh, uh, on these trailers, right? And then the inlet uh, also needs to be high enough above the ground to minimize local influences. So, if there are constructions nearby, you need to use even taller stacks to pull in the aerosols, right? Because at the surface there can be surface emission, and then the wind. Uh, wind speed at the surface is also lower, right? So there can be more turbulence near the surface. So they can generate aerosols too. But we want to focus on what is representing most of the air in our, let's say, the boundary layer. So if possible, the sampling duct should be brought through the roof of the laboratory, right? So you don't want to put it outside and then make a bend uh, of the uh, sample flow, so which will create some particle losses. And also, you need to ensure high aerosol transmission efficiency that doesn't vary with wind direction or wind speed. So you cannot make uh, this sample stack to be facing certain direction. So normally what people do is that they put a cap over here, right? So you draw air from the bottom, and then all of the air will go through a bend here to first get rid of the larger particles, right? The, uh, for example, the very heavy dust particles. And then um, they're not specifically uh, or strongly influenced by the wind direction or wind speed. And also these inlets should have a particle cutoff diameter of 10 micrometer aerodynamic size under ambient conditions. So we want to sample the PM10 because that's treated, still treated as a standard for let's say measuring the total mass of the particles. So this is a design of a vertical sampling inlet here, right? So you can see there's a snow protection on the Top, and then the aerosols are basically being withdrawn from the bottom. And then they go through the, uh, let's say, several, two bends here to get uh, introduced into the tube over here. So you have this bend here basically act as a, a size cut, right? And further, you need to make sure that the, the gap here is larger than the stopping distance of the particles that you want to sample. For example, if you want to sample uh, particles of 2.5 micrometer, then you can find out what's the stopping distance, and this S needs to be higher than the stopping distance of um, 2.5 micrometer particles. Okay. Um, so then um, let's say in here, there are more sophisticated de designs, let's say for the um, a tower that can uh, support the sampling inlet system, right? So you can see this is sampling inlet, the head of the sampling inlet, and then you can build it, build these racks to support them so they're more stable. And you, you see the diameter is also pretty big. It's 8.375 inch, right? So this system is designed by NOAA for the ground uh, sampling of the aerosols. So um, after the particles are being sampled through these vertical stacks, and then further to distribute these particles into different instruments, then we need to put further considerations. This is mainly because when the particles are being transported or the, when the airflow is being transported in the tube, you're going to develop a laminar flow. Right? And we know that the velocity nearby the wall is zero and the velocity near the center is the highest. It's the same for the particle concentration. Concentration near the wall is zero and then the concentration at the center is going to be the highest. So because of that, when you take the samples, you cannot simply just split the flow to wherever you want. This is mainly because um, 
if let's say you just directly use a Y here and then the flow on the at the, uh, on the left is pulling, let's say one liter per minute and flow on the right is pulling 10 liter per minute, then the 10 liter per minute flow is going to pull more concentrated aerosols. That's mainly because they pull more of the aerosols from the center, right? So because of that, people actually design these sampling inlets that's located in between, let's say, the center and the wall. So in this case, you get more uniform distribution of the aerosols. And people also try to balance the flow through the different uh, branch. And then um, they could either, let's say, uh, set the flow rate to be the same, right, from each instrument by using extra pumps set up the bypass flow. Or if you can't do that, then if you need to pull a larger flow, then you just make this tube a little bit larger. So you pull more flow from here. But they need to be fixed not at the center, but at the near the, uh, let's say, in between the center and the wall here. So you get a uniform distribution of the aerosols everywhere. Right? So here are some more considerations. For example, for sampling of particles, the pipes should be made of conducting material and uh, electrically grounded. This is to uh, keep the charged particles in the system. If you use dielectric materials like plastics, then they accumulate static charges and then they will basically remove these charged particles. So um, the shorter pieces of tubing might be replaced by conducting sil silicon conductive tubing, which is elastic and conducting at the same time. So a perfect in inlet installation also avoids sources of turbulence as best as possible, and then keeps the sampling lines as short as possible. And eventually this is isokinetic flow splitter. So a sample is removed from the core of the uh, main aerosol flow rather than from the streamlines near the wall. This ensures that a representative sample uh, sampling, especially of pores and nanoparticles, right? So basically you will pull the flow from the, uh, let's say, not near by the wall. Okay. So we also need to do some sample drying, right? So the dry sample, um, the reason why we use dry sample is to we want to remove the high growth, I mean, to reduce the growing of the particles, because we know that for the salt particles or for any particles, they will have some of these hygroscopic growths under certain RH. And also to compare, let's say, the particle mass under um, a standard condition is needed, right? If you compare the same aerosol uh, mass under measured under 20% RH and under 40% RH, their mass will be different because the 40% RH samples are going to absorb water and then they're going to contribute more to the mass. So um, basically in this dry sample, then the hygroscopic growth can be uh, minimized. And then the preferred method for reducing radical humidity are to remove the water with a diffusion dryer or a membrane dryer. Um, and alternatively, alternatively, to reduce dew point temperature by diluting the sample with future dry air, right? So there are two ways. It's just now if you're diluting the samples, you need to know what is the dilution ratio. So you can do the back calculation of the aerosol samples. Okay. So, uh, or people could also try to warm up the sample. So you can, um, by increasing the, temp uh, increasing the temperature of the sample, uh, as we said earlier, then the saturation vapor pressure of the water is going to increase. But the partial vapor pressure of water in the gas stream is the same. So because of that, the RH gets lower. But the thing is that you cannot heat it up by too much. Otherwise, the semi-volatile species will turn into gas species. So basically, you are um, altering the sample, uh, the, the sample property. So I would say right now, the most mass, uh, widely used method is still to use a diffusion dryer or the membrane dryer. The membrane uh, membrane dryer is also known as a naphium dryer. So basically you use a naphium, naphium um, uh, membrane to extract or provide water vapor through the membrane. Okay. So here I'm just going to show you two pictures, or a few pictures of the dryers. So this one is a diffusion dryer. So what you do is you can introduce the aerosol samples from one end to the other end. Well, at the same time, the, there are silicon beads inside this column here. So when the aerosols are being introduced, there's actually a porous film for the aerosols to go through, okay? So what happens is the water can diffuse through the porous film and then to uh, get 
um, absorbed by these uh, desiccants or silica gels, right? So right now, if the uh, if the air is dry, then the silica gels will be blue. If the air is wet, right, after absorbing too much water, these gels will turn into pink or turn to, let's say, transparent. So under that situation, you have to heat up the gels again and then to basically uh, regenerate these gels because this is a diffusion dryer. So diffusion dryer is very easy to operate. So you can easily put that into your lab system to dry up the aerosols. But the thing is that if we consider the long-term deployment of some instruments, let's say we want to put an SMPS system in the Amazon forest, right, to monitor the aerosol properties over a whole year, then we might need meet a problem because uh, for those long-term monitoring systems, we don't want to put a person there to continuously monitor the instrument because in, inside the Amazon forest, there's nothing much to do over there. Right, so we want the system to be autonomous. Right, it can run by itself. Uh, but for these um, um, these uh, diffusion dryers, as we said, they, when they get wet, they have to be regenerated. Right. So um, under that situation, you have to send a person there to replace the diffusion dryer. And this is especially the case for the Amazon forest, or let's say in generally the, in the forest, mainly because um, those are rainforests. Right. So the um, let's say the rainforests are are going to be very humid, especially overnight. And generally in natural environments, let's say over grassland or forests, overnight the RH will also get higher. So if the RH is high, it means that these um, diffusion dryers need to be replaced more frequently. Right? So the system is not going to be autonomous by themselves. So under that situation, we need to use the membrane dryers. So here I'm showing you a few pictures of the Nafium dryer or the membrane dryer. So the way it works is that the Nafium dryer actually only, uh, I mean, it has the pore size that only allow water vapor or water molecule to go through. Right? If you consider water is uh, H2O, a molecular weight of 18. So its size is actually much smaller than the oxygen and oxygen molecule or nitrogen molecule. So you could create this membrane that only allow water vapor to go through, but not the oxygen or nitrogen uh, molecules to go through, right? So under this situation, so if you send in the aerosol sample here, and then the, the solid line here represents the nafium dryer. So separating the blue and the white, right? So this uh, black line that's separating the blue color and white color of the membrane. Okay, so um, basically now, if you just send in dry air, right? Dry air doesn't have any water vapor in there. So the water vapor in the sample here is going to diffuse the dry air, mainly because there's no water vapor, so they can go through. But a more easy way to do that is you can just set this volume here to be vacuum. So what you do is, you connect these two pores directly to a vacuum pump. So that create a low pressure here. So as we said, the oxygen and nitrogen are not going to go through the membrane, right? So only hydro, uh, only water molecules can go through. If water molecules can go through, then it means that we can directly draw the water molecules out. And in this way, you dry the samples directly, right? So um, basically, this is how the nitrogen dryer can reduce the water vapor concentration or reduce the RH from the sampled uh, aerosols. So here there are different systems like uh, using smaller diameter or the larger diameter, mainly to consider the pressure drop through the system. When you need to send a high flow into the system, you will need a, like a wider tube here. But the mechanic, mechanism is the same. You use nafium dryers to pull or nafium membranes to uh, basically um, generate a barrier between the low water vapor concentration region and a high water vapor concentration region. So the water molecules can diffuse through the membrane. So we mentioned that this membrane can actually um, reduce the RH, but we could also use it in the reverse way, that is uh, to humidify the aerosols. So remember when we talk about the tandem differential mobility analyzer or the HTDMA, we have to humidify the aerosols to certain RH, let's say 80%, 85%. Right, so to humidify the aerosol samples, we could just directly use the nafium membrane to introduce the water molecules in here. 
and then further control how much water vapor you provide to maintain the RH in the aerosol stream, right? So you can use that in both ways to provide the water vapor to the aerosol samples. So here are some pictures of the, um, uh, let's say the dryer system, right? For example, the aerosols are being withdrawn from here, from this inverted funnel here. And then you see this has a bend here. Technically, you need to pull in the aerosols directly from the roof, right, to avoid this bend. But after the aerosols are inside, you see this napping dryer here, which removes the water vapor from the system, right? And this is another napping dryer. So uh, it seems like there are two branches of napping dryers going into different instruments. So you also need to consider the local contamination from the ground sampling, right? So especially when you select a site uh, to sample these ambient aerosols. So one example can be um, when I was in my postdoc study, I was in this uh, campaign uh, that's led by uh, uh, Jian Wang, which is uh, who's my postdoc advisor. So this campaign was uh, organized on the one of the islands over the Azores. Okay, so if you check on maps, Azores is a like, chain of islands in the center of the Atlantic Ocean. So Basically, um, the islands are very small, so we could uh, sample representative marine aerosols that represents, let's say, the general aerosol property over the ocean. Because when we say that the human activity actually contribute a lot to the climate change, let's say the aerosols and clouds and climate, but the Earth overall is still 70%, right, covered by the ocean. So we have to understand overall how the ocean aerosols is uh, behaving, right? To understand their cloud and climate impacts. So to set up this station, uh, we need to consider these uh, local con contamination events. So uh, my, uh, my memory is that at the beginning of the, or before the campaign starts, there were selections of different uh, monitoring site locations. There can be a site that's set up directly nearby the shoreline, right? So you can directly sample the aerosols, or you could take aerosols a little bit inland that's closer to the airport. Um, and there, there are better, let's say, logistic support. You have electricity, water, and so on. And also you don't need to go across these fields. Transportation is easier. So eventually this site was selected. And now you can naturally think about how the uh, aircraft or how the airplanes is going to affect the aerosol sampling over this region, right? Although this is a small island, there are still, let's say, two or three flights every day uh, arriving and departing at the airport, right? That's mainly for the commuting among the islands. So because of that, you will see these huge spikes during certain time periods. And uh, this is not ideal, right? So we have to find out ways to basically filters to get rid of these contamination events by using, let's say, uh, black carbon concentration, right? Because the aircraft engine emits soot. And also by using total particle concentrations. Where you see the total particle concentration is also very high during these contamination events. Um, but if initially we could set up the station nearby the shoreline, then our problem will be significantly addressed. So uh, we have talked about these ground sampling of the aerosols. Now we'll start to talk about the aircraft sampling of the aerosols. So here I'm showing a picture of the uh, G1 Gulfstream 1 aircraft that's maintained by the Department of Energy. So this aircraft has been used in many, many of the uh, field campaigns to look at the aerosol cloud and climate interactions. So this is a photo of the aircraft inside. So you can see these racks being mounted onto the floor. They have to be very stable. So the vibration of the aircraft and also the aircraft taking off, landing, won't move the location of the aircraft, right? Because there are also passengers or scientists sitting on the aircraft. You don't want to get them hurt, okay? So basically um, here, this is, um, so before each deployment, you have to make sure that uh, the payload is balanced, right? So um, basically you have to distribute the weight of the instruments Right? So it's not tilting towards one side of the aircraft. So um, we have to basically report 
all of the weight and then also the power draw of the instruments, right? So to at least make sure that the aircraft can successfully take off and land. And then um, also these uh, spacings are specifically designed that the, in, the interference from one another is reduced. I remember when we were deploying one of our, uh, or the, the fast integrable spectrometer or the FIMS onto the NASA aircraft, uh, they were planning to basically install a pump that's nearby our instrument. And the FIMS is using the imaging method to take a look, take a look at these um, particles going through the laser. And, and if the pump is generating a lot of vibration, then it's going to affect the image quality uh, that's showing these particles, right? So we don't want to want that to happen. So eventually we did many tests or test flight to analyze our data and eventually found that, well, that's okay. It seems that the vibration impact is relatively small, but you will never know. So in these field campaigns, um, these instruments are also under, let's say, non-normal uh, conditions, right? So um, let's say when the aircraft is a few kilometers above the ground, the ambient pressure is also lower, temperature is also lower. So these instruments are subject to non-normal conditions, and then some instruments may directly just get failure. Right. So uh, one example is that for some instruments like the Cloud Probe, when the temperature is really low outside, right, so there will be freezing or icing onto the instrument and it just cannot provide any data anymore. Okay. So actually the aircraft measurement of the um, atmospheric system has been dated back to very early in our human uh, society, right? This is aircraft measurement, you know? Before aircraft, we also have the balloon. People even use a balloon to go into the clouds and then to learn about meteorology. So this aircraft measurement showing here, this is 1949, right? People take pictures of the ice crystals that's being formed in our cloud systems. So then um, you may say, well, it seems that the aircraft measurement is very difficult. So why do we still do aircraft measurements? Right. So it's uh, complicated, right? A lot of safety um, protocols getting involved. And also the, the aircraft measurement also takes a lot of resources, right? Why do we still care about that? So the main reason we still want to use aircraft to do these measurements is we want to understand the atmospheric processes and then the impact of the aerosols on cloud systems. So the best location to do these measurements is at the cloud level. Okay, so uh, our group recently had this study. Uh, it was accepted by the Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics, which is showing that, um, I mean, this is the an analysis of the aerosol size distribution over the Southern Great Plains, which is one of the main DOE observatories. So we're, we were trying to look at the vertical distribution of aerosol size distributions. So the x-axis is the particle size, the y-axis, the altitude, the color here represents the concentration. So you can see, well, at the surface, the concentration is always the highest. It's mainly because the surface is the emission source of the particles. But when you get to the cloud level, right, between one and two kilometers above the ground, you see the aerosols are very different compared to the surface. So what you measure and further calculate it, let's say the cloud impact or the climate impact of the aerosols by using the data only from the ground, is not necessarily the same compared to the results if you do the measurement near the cloud level. For example, uh, this is showing you the spring season and summer season. So in the spring season, you also see a lot of new particle formation in the higher altitude, while compared to the ground, you don't see that much often. But for both of the cases, let's say the concentration in the cloud level is much lower. So during the ACNA campaign, we also did measurement over the open ocean, right? This is showing you the, uh, the, the flight track. Uh, and there we observed that actually it is above the ground in the higher, or what we call the upper decoupled layer of the boundary layer, where you have a significant new particle formation event. This is showing you the concentration particle larger than three nanometer over the concentration particle larger than 10 nanometer. So the higher the ratio, the stronger the new particle formation. So you can see 
this new part formation actually happens in the upper boundary layer instead of at the surface. And as a matter of fact, over the open ocean, people rarely see higher ratio of these two concentrations. So this made us think that new particle formation only happens or mostly happens in the upper boundary layer of the uh, ocean, right? So because of that, you need to do, or you can only do aircraft measurement to find out this mechanism about where the particles are being formed. So here is also showing the size distribution. You can see the higher uh, atmosphere have higher concentration of these particles below 10 nanometers as compared to the surface. So um, in terms of the aircraft measurement of the aerosols, so similar to the ground sampling, you also need to consider how the sampling might perturb the, uh, or might interfere with the aerosol measurement. And one important factor to consider is the boundary layer development nearby the aircraft, right? So here, this is showing you how the velocity is changing as a function of the distance from the nose of the aircraft to the, uh, let's say, the distance from the uh, sampling location to the nose of the aircraft. So basically, if this is zero, then the downstream, the distance is uh, increasing, right? So you can see at the nose, the velocity of the air is much lower, and then this velocity gradually increases um, compared to the frame stream velocity. So clearly, there's a boundary layer being developed nearby the aircraft. And we want to sample the aerosols in this region because here there is a change of the velocity. So it's going to affect inertia and how the particles move in this region, right? So um, basically, um, that's why when people conduct these measurements, they use an approximate guideline that one can use, 160 of the distance from the aircraft nose to the point of measurement. So basically, if you do measurement of uh, uh, ambient aerosols at, let's say, 10 meters, uh, downstream of uh, 10 meters from the nose of the aircraft, right? So from the side of the aircraft, let's say from here. And then the boundary layer is going to be 160. So that's 0. 0.6. No, that's 10 divided by 60. So that's around 0. 0.13, 0. 0.13 meters. So your uh, sampling probe needs to be 0. 0.13 meters away from the surface of the aircraft. So in this way, you will get more representative sample of the aerosols, okay? So basically this is about how the boundary layer is going to get, a, uh, is going to affect the particle distribution. Um, so any measurement instrument or inlet system should be mounted well outside this aircraft boundary layer. So uh, ideally this needs to be calculated from CFD simulations, but you can use this guideline here. Okay, so here, this is also showing you how the velocity profile might affect the sampling of the uh, aerosols. This is the airflow streamline, right? So air will always go, let's say, across. they won't collide onto the surface, right? Air molecules, they just smoothly go through. <clears throat> but it's different when you're talking about larger particles. This is a 100 micrometer particle, which already has a pretty high inertia. So you can see they can actually collide onto the surface of the aircraft, right? And then for those who uh, who doesn't collide, who don't collide with the aircraft, they also have a large inertia that they will move towards the outside of the aircraft. So basically you will have a concentration of the aerosols over here, right? So here you won't see any of the 100 not uh, 100 micrometer particles, but outside you will see actually a higher concentration of these aerosols. So you might get an over sampling or enhancement of the particle uh, sampling. Okay. We also need to consider how the pressure and temperature is changing when we're doing the aircraft measurement because now the speed of the aircraft is pretty high. So in general, for example, the G1 aircraft moves with a, with a speed of around 100 meter per second. So the mass number is already around 0.3. So you can see the temperature is actually going to be higher because of this compressive heating. So if you have a higher temperature, then you're going to evaporate some of these volatile uh, species. So people also need to consider how the exhaust might influence the sampling of the aerosols. So you see, this is the DC-8 research aircraft that's mon uh, managed by NASA. Right. It happens to be that here they have an exhaust port, 
maybe it's from the cabin air, right, for balancing the pressure. But then you see the sampling probes are going to sample the air directly from there, right? So because of that, you want to install the sampler over here to avoid the sampling of the exhaust. Otherwise, you're just taking in the cabin air, not the ambient air. Right? You have this streamline here mainly because of the wing that's uh, located here. Right? The wing is going to lift up the air that's uh, on top of it. So um, basically for these aircraft inlets, due to the loss process, not all of the particles are being sampled representatively to the inlet and transported efficiently to the measurement device. So the inlet efficiency is also a strong function of the particle size. And then therefore the inlets can even be used to prevent particles or droplets from entering the systems. We'll talk about how we can design these inlets so even for the state of art inlets, inlets, sampling bias or artifacts may still occur. And every inlet user should be aware of these problems. So for example, this is one inlet that people can use to sample the aerosols. So it's called the solid diffuse, diffuser type inlet, SDI. So, so basically for the diffuser, it's going to create this expansion region to slow down the velocity of the particles. Right. If you slow that down, or the airstream, if you slow that down, then you can get more representative sample of the air from here. Anomaly uh, for the diffuser inlet, they also have a shroud in front of it. So in this way, when the aircraft is having an a angle of attack, right, it's not when it's not horizontally flying, then it can act as a buffer to basically provide this horizontal. Uh, flow that's facing the diffuser. So you don't lose the particles. Let's say if you don't have this route, then you actually lose particles due to the direct impaction. Okay, so there are some extra words. Feel free to go through them after the class. Um, so there's also another type called the isokinetic diffuser type inlet. So the isokinetic uh, sampling we mentioned earlier in our class basically means that the sampling velocity is going to be the same as the air velocity that's in the ambient, right? So we mentioned that if the velocity is not matching, right, you actually lose uh, many of these larger particles because they have stronger inertia. So you also have the low turbulent inlet, so which are designed to reduce the turbulence in the sampling inlet. Um, so there is this counterflow virtual impact uh, impactor inlet. Right. So we mentioned some inlet can be designed to specifically remove some particles. So this inlet is actually to specifically remove the small particles, but sample the cloud droplet particles. So the way it functions is that, well, if you want to collect the larger particles, then you know that they have a larger inertia. So what it means is that you don't even need to pull flow through the inlet. You can just let the inlet to be uh, going against, uh, let's say, a large velocity. For example, we assume this is 100 meters. Well, at the same time, you can supply flow that push the air outside. So by pushing it outside, then you remove the small particles because the air is bringing in the smaller particles, um, meaning because they have smaller inertia. But the larger particles, they're less influenced by the air velocity, right? Like cloud droplets, they can still go in through this inlet here. And after they're dried up, then they can get sampled, right? So this is to analyze the properties of the cloud droplet. And you can even cloud, uh, collect the cloud droplet liquid for further chemical analysis. So apart from these, let's say, ex situ sampling, right, ex situ analysis, there can also be in situ sampling. So for these uh, cloud sampling systems, they just directly analyze the uh, cloud droplets or aerosols outside the aircraft. So they use laser and basically apply the uh, light scattering properties, light scattering principles to analyze their size, number concentration. You can even take pictures of these particles if their size is already large enough, right? So to look at ice crystals or the shape of these cloud droplets or ice crystals. But the one issue associated with these probes that's outside the aircraft is uh, there may be ice particle bouncing, right? And also the cloud droplet shattering, right? So if this happens, you are going to generate smaller particles and then they can get imaged by the, uh, the laser, the optical system. 
So for example, here it's showing you some of these smaller sections, right? These are the shattered cloud droplets or ice crystals. And it's the same for the rain droplets, right? So you see these secondary uh, droplets being emitted from these the top of these probes here. So one way to identify these shattering event is to actually analyze the velocity of these droplets or this uh, uh, arrival time, right? So the secondary particles are going to, let's say, when they hit onto this probe here, their velocity will drop to zero, right? So, or at least the same velocity as the aircraft. So when they go through this optical region, their velocity is going to be significantly lower compared to the ambient cloud droplets that's going through, right? So in this way, you can separate the arrival time for these particles, right? And further analyze the particles that are have a smaller arrival time, which have a faster uh, velocity. So you could also improve the design for these probes, right? Instead of using these round shaped head here, you can use a very sharp head and then only analyze the aerosols in between. Right, so in this case, the the shattering of the cloud droplets or ice crystals are going to be much more reduced because even if they collide onto the surface here, they're not being analyzed on the outside, but instead they have to get analyzed from the inside. And you can see the difference. Uh, you can have the standard tips and the modified tips. So you see the modified tips will have much cleaner spectrum or images of these uh, cloud droplets or ice crystals. Right. So with modified probe tips, you have cleaner pictures. You can still have a few shattered particles, but the uh, overall is greatly improved. So uh, I think we're getting to the end of this class here. So now I just want to introduce uh, the UAV measurement. So you see uh, people spend a lot of efforts for understanding or to understand the aerosol properties at the cloud level. But um, if you count how many aircraft measurement campaign are being organized every year by different agencies, like, uh, for example, uh, NOAA or NASA or DOE. They probably, in total, each year, there can be maximum, let's say, five or six campaigns, right? And we know in our world, there are so many locations. So the aerosol property over the, let's say, ocean and continent. It can be even different in different climate regions, right? Urban area, suburban, wildland. For example, we have the Everglades over here. So we cannot rely on these uh, expensive systems to monitor the aerosol properties everywhere, right? Um, of course, if we have unlimited resources, we could do that, but uh, that is not the truth for many of the uh, research fields right now. So um, because of that, people have thought about using the unmanned vehicles for monitoring the aerosol properties at higher altitudes. Of course, there are limits for some of these drones, right? rotary, uh, rotary wing UAVs, because you don't want them to fly so high that interfere with the uh, aircraft, let's say commercial aircrafts. But for some of the fixed wings UAVs, people can actually use them to fly even above the cloud level. So in this case, you could uh, significantly reduce the cost for the research aircraft measurement campaigns. So we can just briefly go over, let's say, the rotary wing UAVs and uh, fixed wing UAVs. So for example, if you're using the drones to or the rotary wing UAVs for aircraft aerosol or the ambient aerosol measurement, what considerations should you um, should you think about? Right, when you sample these aerosols. So if you want to sample the aerosols, for example, you bring a CPC onto the air, onto this drone here, right? You can install them. Some of them can have a pretty high payload. So one thing is you don't want to directly sample the air below the fan here, right? Because we know the fan here, there can be some lubricants, right? There can be some volatile organic compounds that even form particles that interfere with your measurement. And also, um, I think another thing is that you need to consider the battery, how far it can go to, how high it can go to, right? And then what type of instrument you want to put onto them. There are some considerations on that, right? And then for the fixed wings UAVs, there are uh, 
bit little bit larger, right? They can carry basically carry more uh, payload onto the aircraft. So here I'm just showing you a few pictures. Actually, this is a new Arctic Shark system that's managed by the Department of Energy. They have already assembled this system, done a few test flights. So this year or this coming up year, they're going to uh, deploy these uh, UAV systems for more sophisticated campaign uh, systems, right? So for this UAV, you see it's still much smaller than the commercialized aircraft. You definitely can't sit into this UAV here. And then uh, they can also get installed with these fancy cloud droplets, uh, cloud probes and uh, aerosol sampling probe that's directly in front of the UAV. So you don't need to worry about the boundary layer or anything. Uh, but still, this is a UAV and you can't put all of those fancy big instruments inside the uh, cabin, right? So that's why for the current design of the uh, DOE UAV system or what, what they call UAS system, people still have to choose what type of measurement they want. They can either choose the aerosol physiochemical properties, which include the CPCs or let's say called droplet measurement, size distributions, or uh, let's say this is optical size, right? And then they can collect the particles based on filtration, right? The filter sampler, or they can just focus on the aerosol size distribution that has mobility size distribution down to 10 nanometer and then some other measurement systems, okay? Um, so currently, this is again showing you the DOE UAV system. They are using that for, or starting to use them for some aircraft uh, or ambient cloud level, ambient aerosol measurement. But we could also always go back to the traditional method, right? To use the balloon systems, the tethered balloon systems. So um, actually, multiple agencies also have these systems, so they can tie their instrument at the bottom of these tethered balloon, right? And then to take the samples, but they're tethered, which means that um, they're in terms of their height, they cannot be at a very high altitude. And also uh, there's a limit for the, um, again, for the payload of the instruments, okay? So actually our college, uh, so Dr. Daniel Bertrand is, uh, um, actually um, maintaining several of these, or he owns several of these tether balloon systems. So um, our plan is that to in deploy some instruments onto these balloon for just probing the vertical distribution of aerosols or trace gases over the Miami area. So in this case, we can also get some vertical distribution of the uh, air properties, okay? So that's it for this class. Feel free to let me know if you have any questions.